Hi folks, hope you are okay today. It's good to be with you. We're having a public lecture on missiology and uh, I'll be giving you the detail of the topic. But before I do, let's read the scripture and pray. Paul in Romans chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God which he had promised afore by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom also we receive grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are you called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. Without ceasing, I make mention you always in my prayers, making request it by any means. Now at length I might have uh, a precious journey by the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant brethren that oftentimes I purpose to come unto you but was here after all um, but was let here after that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am a debitor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as, as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace. We give you the prayers, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. And Father, we pray as we look at this lecture that you will bless us today, and may it be used for your glory, Lord. Amen. Okay. Um, we're looking at the question is how did Christianity in the West define itself before the great period of mission okay and we're going to look at a quote I go back to Africa to try to make an open path for commerce and Christianity that's by David Livingston. I uh, put here in my lecture, we are missionary agents, whether we're conscious of it or not. Uh, and we have to recognize the forces of colonial and imperial expansion from the West. Do we have to recognize that when we look at the history of missions? So my lecture is going to look at the question of how did Christianity in the West define itself before the great period of mission? Number two, we're going to look at 19th century missionary activity. Then number three, we're going to have some critical reflection. And then number four, we're going to have some conclusion. So part, uh, part uh, one, how did Christianity define itself in the West before the great period of mission? I think this question is important because the 19th century missionary enterprise did not develop out of a vacuum. What became before it in terms of theology and culture was to play a significant part in defining missionary practice. One of the most important factors that was to shape future Christianity was the enlightenment of the 18th century. There was at that time a tremendous confidence growing in the human mind and the ability of humanity to solve all its problems economically and socially. Who were the main players in the days of the Enlightenment? We have Voltaire in 1694 to 1778, David Hume in 1711 to 1776, Edward Gibbon 1737 to 1794, 
Christian Wolf, 1679 to 1754, and G. Lessing, 1729 to 1781, and Jean Rousseau in 1712 and 1778, and Goth in 1743 to 1805, and Thomas Paine in 1737 to 1809. But just a few of the many writers who in different ways advocated a confidence in human achievement. This confidence dealt a death blow to Roman Catholicism when expressed in the French Revolution. At the same time as this confidence of humanity grew, a spiritual awakening took place in America, England, Germany and France. Louis Martin, the French Catholic, wrote books in defense of Christianity and made the faith respectable to the masses. In Britain, revival began under the leadership of men like John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield and Henry Venn, and the artistic lady Hannah Moore. This revival of Christianity was defined by doctrine, the doctrine of biblical inspiration, salvation by faith alone, and the priesthood of all believers. They were faithful to Reformation theology. This theology was to be the foundation and motive of much missionary activity. Quote, this is Ch uh, Chidester, page 44. I'll give the fuller reference later. Quote, among English-speaking Protestants in Britain and North America, the enthusiasm for missions to America was stimulated by the transatlantic evangelical revivals. As a broad religious trend that produced Methodist and Baptist churches, but also influenced Anglican Congregational and Presbyterian churches, evangelical Christianity represented a revitalization movement to convert individuals in societies that were already nominally Christian, taking seriously the biblical mandate to evangelize all the nations. Protestant missionary agencies, the London Missionary Society, 1795, Church Missionary Society, 1799, and the Wesleyan Methodist Missionary Society, 1813, and the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Mission, 1810, began working actively in Africa at the beginning of the 19th century. We conclude this section by saying that it was a fundamental desire for missionaries to spread their faith, as this was their heritage, but they could not help being influenced by the Enlightenment heritage, in her, heritage of optimistic humanism. This optimism was saturated into Western culture, and Christians shared this. It would be no surprise to say that missionaries took on board this optimism unwittingly but consciously took it with them on the mission field this would suggest the missionaries were agents consciously so uh, conscious unconsciously of colonial expansion 19th century missionary activity the 19th century was a time of wealth and power for the west as the century progressed there was a rapid increase in the exploration of the physical environment there was also interesting knowledge on how to master the environment. There was a wonderful success in fighting pests and crop control and cities began to mushroom and squalor was rife. Karl Marx sounded a warning to the West that capitalism was the problem. The colonial powers were trying to make empires in Africa and Asia and some countries like Japan saw the might of colonialism and tried to modernize to meet the threat. Some were bullied into accepting colonial trade such as China Darwin, Spencer, Payne were the intellectual influences of the day, and education, be education became part of state responsibility. All this progress was used by missionaries to propagate the faith. North African Mission. Between 1815 and 1914, most of the north shore west of Egypt was occupied by Western European powers, and this led to a number of conversions. In the 1830s and 40s, Algeria was conquered by France, and it was said many people became Christian here. In Egypt, there was a more complex situation. There were a number of different groups who had been in the land for centuries during the work in the area. Doing the work in the area. Quote, um, Lasaretti, page 1206. Quote, here there were ancient churches which had never died out. The largest was the monophysite in faith and although the vernacular of its members was arabic it continued its service in the coptic language had been the speech of most of the population before the muslim arab conquest end of quote 
The Greek Orthodox Church was active in Egypt, bolstered by Greek migrants and the Church Missionary Society and others. The Church Mission Missionary Society was able to build a church of up to 1,000 uh, from a Coptic and Muslim population. In Ethiopia, the ancient church held out against Islam. And in Cyprus, it was predominantly Greek Orthodox, but it is to be noted that very few Muslims became Christians in North African mission. Next, Latin America. Positivism, advocated by a comet, was a major influence in Latin America. This was seen in the bitter struggles for power in these countries. The clerics wanted the church to rule the countries and the anti-clerics wanted states to run the church. On the cloak side was Gracia Mereno, and he was a typical statement of his statesman of his time, highly educated and influenced by liberal political thinking from Europe. He ruled Ecuador with an aristocratic flair. Other factors that controlled mission in Latin America was a lack of clergy. It was not until 1899 that the Pope could change the situation, and that too, and that was to send help from Europe. Africa. By 1884, to 1885, colonial powers were furiously dividing up Africa for themselves. The make state by doing this instability was brought into the region. This period of African missionaries were busy fighting the slave trade. The missionaries translated score of languages to writing and they started schools, they brought medicine and standardized morals. In places like South Africa, missionaries were met by a number of cultures. They were descendants of slaves, Dutch, Indian and even Chinese population. David Livingston began his missionary work uh, this side of Africa in 1813 to 1817. He is a typical example of the attitude of missionaries in the region. Uh, Lateretti, page 1315, quote, He loved the Africans, dealt with them tactfully and selflessly, and won their confidence, fearless and with an inobitable indomitable will he drove his body often racked and spent with fever and dysentery and he did incredible exploits end of quote after livingston's death his friend stanley continued his work the chief of baghdad baghdad became a christian through stanley and the reason the chief became a christian is interesting the chief thought that the european technology was superior to that of the africans and this made him follow the european god Madagascar and Africa, south of Sahara. In Madagascar, the chiefs were noted for wanting to exploit European methods and tools to enlarge their domains. Chiefs made the diplomatic and commercial overtures to the British and encouraged the coming of teachers. Favour was also shown to the London Missionary Society. They opened schools, translated the Bible and made a hymn book. And in 1836, Christians were ordered out and in the 1860s, chieftains were converted and Christians spread again. India. In, 18, in 1792, the Baptist Mission, Missionary Society started with William Carey. He and many like him began to arrive in India. It was not easy in those early days. The East Indian Company was hostile to missionaries and Carey was not put off. He settled near Calcutta, where he translated the Bible and found a school. In 1806, Henry Martin arrived as chaplain to the East Indian Company and kept up his duties to the troops and preached to Hind Hindus and Muslims. He also set up a school and did translating work. Even evangelicals back home lobbied Parliament and eventually the East Indian Company had to give way to an influx of missionary activity. Some more important points need to be made about missionary work. The main religion was Hinduism, and the main outstanding feature in India was British rule. This brought Western civilization. The Indian landscape was crisscrossed by railways, telegraph lines, and a postal service, and the English language. The colonial education was standard in India. Even a British court system was forced on the Indians. All this brought peace and prosperity to India for, 400, for hundreds of years. There was an indigenous Christian population the ancient Syrian church, which traced its origins to the Apostle Thomas, here is his description of Christian activity in those days, quote, In some places, missionaries undertook measures to raise the economic level of the chronically destitute Christians by cooperative stores, rice banks, industrial schooling and cottage industries, and improved methods of agriculture. Tracts of land were obtained on them and 
Christian colonies were developed from outcast and low caste groups, end of quote. In 1914, India had over 2 million Catholics and there were 5,000 Protestant missionaries. The whole work was sustained by a typical missionary like Alexander Dove, 1806 to 1878 who used schools to give education to Brahmins, women and girls. He pioneered agriculture and looked after lepers, such people like Ramabia in 1858 to 1922. A Hindu woman were converted and then had influence uh, with the Hindus. Ceylon, Malaya, Peninsula, Thailand, Indochina, and Philippines and Burma. In Ceylon, sorry, Indochina, in Ceylon, Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholicism arrived in the 16th century. In Burma, you had a Buddhist culture. This land was ruled by Britain in 1824, 1826, 1832, and 1885. There were few Christian converts, and Adonai Judson was used greatly in Burma in 1788 to 1850. He did translation work in Singapore, uh, and Islam was strong. Missionaries used seaports to get in get in with little effect. In Indochina, there was severe persecution of Christians and many Roman Catholics died. In the Philippines, there was success. Many became Roman Catholics and the land was under Spanish rule until 1898. Then America took over. The Americans set up an education system and Rome would not appoint bishops, so many Philippines broke away from the Mother Church. China. In 1818, it was difficult to get into China. There were some 200,000 Catholics in the country, and Robert Morrison was able to do some translation work on the outskirts of China, but the doors of China were forced open by Britain. War with Britain was in 1839 to 1842, and the British demanded trade status. The implication of this are as follows, quote, by the ensuing treaty, a treaty which was supplemented by by one with the United States and with other Western powers, five ports were open to foreign residents. The island of Hong Kong was ceded to Britain and foreigners were accorded extra, ter, uh, extra territorial status. A fixed tariff was scheduled and official intercourse, intercourse was based on the principle of equality." End of quote. China's humiliation was to continue through the years she lost a war against Japan and then she had to watch a war between Japan and Russia being fought on her own soil. In 1912, Confucius education was given up for Western education and the work in China was conducted by missionaries such as Hudson Taylor. Here are a number of things which, like him, mission, uh, here are a number of things missionaries like him struggled to do in China. Number one, found and nourish churches. Number two, preach in streets number three distribute literature number four produce millions of copies of the bible five founded schools six pioneered medicine seven invested in public health education eight led in the care of the insane and blind nine led in famine relief ten helped the methods with methods of agriculture korea and japan it was in 1784 that missions started in Korea. Converts were made among the intelligentsia by the 1870s. Uh, Protestant missionaries were on the move. Bible classes were established, and in the 16th century, Japan, in the 16th century, Japan was reached by the Jesuits. Yeah, so, sorry. It was 1784 that the mission started in Korea. Converts were among the, the intelligentsia. By 1870s, Protestant missionaries were on the move. Bible classes were established. And during the 16th century in Japan, it was reached by the Jesuits. By the 1850s, Japan kept herself aloof from the West. Then suddenly, near the end of the 19th century, she embraced Western culture. Japan developed Western education and a Western-style army and navy. Conclusion. These are my lecture notes that have been typed out. Conclusion. What does this historical what does this historical 
look at 19th century missionary mission tellers. First, imperialism was active all over the world, active in political dominion and the dissemination of their cultures. India is an example of what they received at the hand of the British rule. Missionaries helped this imperialism by propagating Western values through education and the transplanting of Western technology. Secondly, every continent had its own set of problems, so a one theory to fit all mentality will not do. Christians did missionary work in different ways because of the different circumstances. For example, missionaries in Africa were not as respectful of the indigenous culture as the missionaries of China. Thirdly, some countries are not already ancient Christian cultures. This means the charge that Christianity is itself a form of imperialism is ruled out when the indigenous people have already had a long tradition of Christianity. Fourthly, the vast majority of missionary work all over the world was concerned with salvation and genuine missionary humanitarian aid. Third, critical reflection. There are a number of questions and opinions that we have to look at before we can make up our minds. What is the general view of scholars on the issue at hand? I have found virtually no writer who is pro-missionary, but almost all are negative to 19th century missionary practice. Quote, historians, anthropologists, and theologians unite in their judgment that missionaries have been guilty of foisting their own cultural values on their converts. They have upset the stability of indigenous, indigenous social systems and saddled the younger churches of the third world with a thoroughly foreign Christianity. End of quote, Stanley, uh, page 157. Stanley goes on to give his own thoughts. He believed that missionaries wanted to propagate the gospel of civilization. Besides the fact how missionaries got the natives to put on Western dress, and he points out how Baptist missionaries had a lowest uh, estimate of Indian national life. Stanley says that he believes strongly that missionaries were indeed concerned to make civilized man before being Christian. He then notes that missionaries did not have a sense of genetic superiority, but the liberal Christianity did have more of an imperialistic outlook to natives. However, he notes that the conservative wing of Christianity did not have an optimistic view of human progress, and they've, this gave them more of a positive attitude to their surroundings. For example, that is why Hudson Taylor want, wanted to dress like the Chinese. The question, is it true civilization before conversion? We looked at mission reports and they tell how those going on to the missionary field were wanting to win people for Christ, not civilization. What did the Wesleyan missionary report concentrate on with its works in China? They report not about the victories of civilization, but the churches are distributed tracts and New Testaments. Telford, page 144. The Ceylon report was enthusiastic at the success of people believing in the truth of Christ. Telford, page 147. Ceylon, report, Ceylon reports attacks from Buddhist. They saw the fight was an ideological in terms of truth versus error, not civilization versus primitive man. It is clear in some cases then, civilization was not the agenda, primarily so, of missionaries. One of the most devastating critics of missionaries of the past is Pitifer. He shows no mercy and he often points out that these missionaries were failures. Even when missionaries saved many slaves, so what? Because they were put in work camps and treated harshly. Livingston is a joke, a secret of fame, who failed pathetically, a person who lost faith in missionary work, as traditionally known. Quote, Yet Livingston's own experience had taught him that the word of God alone was not enough to heal the open sword of the world. When he told his Senate House audience they go back to Africa to try to make an open path for commerce and Christianity, he was cheered to the rafters. In the mind of his audience, these two aims, enterprise and evangelism, were wholly compatible. End of quote. Pitifer also, like Stanley, notes that missionaries had one ambition to lift folk to, up to Western civilization. He says that missionaries regarded Africans as heathens, ignorant, helpless and evil. He proves this by reporting on what the American Methodists wrote at the time. Heathen man, tragedy, heathen, ignorant, helpless, Christian man, triumph, intelligent, Christian force for righteousness, 
social and economic good. Either motherhood, savage childhood has but one teacher. The mother, savage motherhood makes the future generation savage. These are these are headlines. Christian motherhood. The Christian mother is the maker of future generations of Christians. Without her, the task looks almost hopeless. Pitifer notes this is an outrageous, racist, arrogant to say the least. He then has some compelling pictures and we see African boys dressed in Western suits. And we see the Chishuoka mission band and they have Western drums. On one picture we are shown a Jesuit priest playing music to African boys on a xylophone. Then on top of this it gives a furious attack on James Moffat who he says was more interested in selling his skills as a munitions repair worker. Prefer, uh, Petifer point, paints the missionaries as evil agents of colonialism. Is this fair? I think that civilization was a second in, in importance to the missionaries. What was important was salvation. Though the two did go together. But even the desire to bring civilization was out of love for the people. Jay Moffat sums up his 40 years as missionary work. Quote, my dear brother, what an animated prospect we have in view. Our saviour reigns, the lamb is in the midst of the throne. What a stimulus to zeal in all that is reference to our redeemer in this world, that we may meet them, not only those to whom God in his great mercy has made us the means of their advancement to the many mansions, end of quote. It cannot be denied that missionaries were con conscious agents of colonialism from Petifer's evidence. But Petifer gives a moral explanation of that evidence. The missionaries were wrong to do so. But my question to him is this, why did they do what they did? It was out of sacrificial love in most cases. Here is a missionary's letter as he reports what it cost him to bring the gospel to China. Quote, the Lord has honored us by giving us fellowship in his sufferings, three times stoned, robbed of everything, even clothes. We know what hunger, thirst, nakedness, weariness are as never before, but also sustaining grace and strength of God and his peace in a new strength of God and his peace in a new and deeper sense than ever. Quote, billow after billow has gone over me, home gone. Not one memento of dear Maggie, even penniless, wife, child gone to glory. Edith lying aside with diarrhea in one village after a heavy stoning with brick bats. They put ropes under me and dragged me along the ground that I might die in the village itself. End of quote. Petiver's book we found to be unscholarly. He fails to give a hearing to both sides of the argument and he judges the past but fails to realize you can't impose our standards and expectations onto the past and use that as a measuring rod. He simply fails to reflect what the Africans of the day thought of the missionaries. That should be our starting point for historical work. Finally, the pictures we see of technology being brought to Africa, was it really that bad? New inventions are made every year, but do we keep them under lock and key? If Europe had knowledge about crop control, then why should not the Africans have a share in this? Mistakes were made, but the evidence is pushed too far to prove an anti-colonialism agenda. Even if Christian missionaries were interested in making civilized people rather than converts, did the Chinese martyrs die because they wanted people to use forks rather than chopsticks? <laughs> Woo. Amen. What is the conclusion? We believe the evidence points to the fact that missionaries were conscious agents of colonialization. We're sorry, what is the conclusion? We believe the evidence points to the fact, or I believe that the evidence points to the fact that missionaries were unconscious agents of colonialization. But colonialization in the best sense. Through history, and as Stanley and Peterborough have shown, there was a strong will to civilize foreign foreigners. This, we, we, as I have shown, was done through education, medicine, commerce, and agriculture. This was inevitable as the centuries was one of technological revolution and all were to see its benefits. 
India received an imperial system of weights. In China, magazines were set up to teach the Western sciences. Japan adopted much of Western technology. Everybody saw the benefits of Western technology. In fact, if you fail to realize this, you fail to understand that century. Even Africans themselves were not naive enough to close their eyes to the benefits of the West. They fully exploited the situation. But in all this, missionaries wanted to save souls. They wanted to help the people practically. Some harm was done as they worked in times of, in a time of aggressive colonialism, a colonialism that was exploitative and heavy handed. Some harm was done because at times missionaries lacked the skills to appreciate the cultural achievements of the natives. This was due to ignorance as most missionaries received no training, but were just left to stand on their own feet. Yes, the mission was a, were agents of colonialization unconsciously so but it was not as bad as the scholars have made out their achievements were awesome their their achievements were phenomenal millions fed millions received medical care and free education ancient languages recorded the seed was sown of a christian faith and now the west is morally bankrupt but the east is blooming with a christian revival Amen. Okay, references to the work, to the lecture, and um, look up these books, have a look at them, read them. Okay, The Foreign Threat and Opening of the Ports, Cambridge History of Japan, Cambridge University Press, New York, W. Beasley, 1989. Christianity, a Global History, Penguin Press. D. Chidester, 2000. Christian Missions and Their Impact to, 19, to 1900, Cambridge History of China, Volume 10, Cambridge University Press, New York. P. Cohen, 2000. Letter to Family. Martin Missionaries of the China Inland Missionary, Inland Mission, 1900, Morgan and Scott, London. E. Cooper, 1900. L. Uh, sorry, Colonialism in Africa, Cambridge History of Africa, University Press, New York, L. Gann, 1969. Black Christians and White Missionaries, Yale University Press, New Haven, 1990, R. Gray, 1990. The Selection and Training of Missionaries in the Early 19th Century, The Mission of the Church and the Propagation of the Faith of Cam Cambridge University Press, Cambridge, P. Hinchcliffe, 1970. A History of Christianity, Harper, New York. K. Latoretti, 1953. The New Cambridge History of India, Cambridge University Press, New York, 1991. D. Ludden. Missionaries, BBC Books, London, 1990. J. Pettifer, 1990. The Bible and the Flag, IVP, Leicester. B. Stanley, 1990. A Short History of Wesleyan Methodist Foreign Missions, Charles H. Kelly, London. G. Telford, 1903. Robert Moffat, Religious Tract and Book Society. W. Walters, 1884. That's all my sources for this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it was uh, informative. I hope it, it gives missionaries, pastors and uh, evangelists and leaders for mission some pointers to... Uh, point your strategy to point your prayer and to think about how you can move forward in mission uh, with your church and um, if you want to use this lecture in your church uh, you want to make a copy of this lecture pass it on to your church or, or wherever you feel free to do so uh, without charge let's come before the Lord Father God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love and we thank you for your blessings and we give you the prayers and we give you the glory today. We thank you that you are our God. And Father, we pray that you would give us the passion for mission like our forefathers, for those who suffered for the gospel, who val valiantly went on serving for you and proclaiming the word. Help us to do the same for our generation, Lord. Give us the wisdom to know how to reach our generation for you, Lord, in your name. Amen.
Amen. I hope that you found that lecture a blessing. That's it for me today. Look out for the coming weeks on other channels for sermons, lectures, and debates and discussions. Okay? Thank you for listening and God bless you.